Studies show that many high school students simply become disengaged from their schoolwork. Why? And more importantly, what could change that? Trevor McKenzie teaches high school English in Victoria, BC, and that's given him a front row seat to what's going on. And that's why he says, if we want better outcomes, it's time to rethink the nature of teaching and learning. His new book is Dive Into Inquiry, Amplify Learning and Empower Student Voice. And it brings Trevor McKenzie to our studio tonight. Hi. Hi. Nice to have you here. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to talk about the book. Brilliant. But I'm always interested to know why people do what they do. Mm. Why educate? Why educate? Um, you know, the biggest reason is it's the world of tomorrow in our hands today. Um, and I think that uh, having a, a role in educating our youth and, and shaping the world of tomorrow is critical. And you said that since becoming a parent, it's made you a better teacher. Absolutely. Why is that? Yeah, I think for many reasons, but you know, the first reason is seeing the world through my children's eyes really made me see that the students in front of me, the learners that I work with are other people's sons and daughters, and, and they are very unique in their learning styles and the questions that they ask. And I need to find a way to honor that voice in my classroom more often. So part of it's empathy mm -hmm. uh, for others, but definitely part of it is just being grounded in the relationships that are before you. Now let's get into the book. Yeah. Um, you write about Garrison. Garrison, yeah. Who is he? Garrison's a former student. Uh, I worked with him for three or four years. Uh, struggling student, really charismatic and caring, but uh, was experiencing some hardships that you know you don't want any of your students to face. Poverty, uh, drug addiction in the family, uh, low income kind of situation. Um, and Garrison was having trouble sticking with school. It wasn't for him. And he was really good at hoop jumping and kind of going through the role of being a learner. Um, but Garrison would disappear from school for days and weeks on end. And we were doing everything to kind of keep Garrison connected to his learning. I kind of felt like I was Garrison's champion for three years. Mm -hmm. And eventually Garrison just kind of slipped through my fingers and disappeared for a couple months. And uh, driving for coffee one day at lunch, I saw Garrison skating in a local skate park, mm -hmm. and I asked him to come for coffee with me. And I think that that conversation with Garrison was the biggest shift, or resulted in the biggest shift I made in my teaching practice. So what happened? I asked him one simple question, and that was, you know, Garrison, what do you truly love to do? What makes you tick? What do you do in your free time? And I was surprised to hear it was graffiti art, mm -hmm. uh, because I had never heard of this coming from him before in the three, four years I had worked with him previously. And I said, I don't believe it. And he said, come on, I'll show you. And so we jumped back in my car and we drove a few blocks. And I kid you not, we climbed over some railroad road tracks to an abandoned warehouse and there was Garrison's artwork. And it blew me away for many reasons. It blew me away because he was so willing to publicly share mm -hmm. something that was so uh, vulnerable for him to share. Uh, it blew me away because it was beautiful. Um, and it blew me away because there were so many pieces of our learning evident in his work. You know, I saw theme, I saw symbolism, I saw poetry. Mm -hmm. And those were elements I wasn't seeing Garrison touch down on in the classroom. Um, and so we turned it into, you know, essentially uh, assignments for class. You know, I said, Garrison, could you write about your, your inspirations bef behind uh, graffiti art? And the next day he came into class with an eloquently written paper. Mm -hmm. And that was the most engaging piece of writing I'd ever seen Garrison produce. And so we explore this throughout the rest of this, the year, this highly personalized approach to Garrison's learning. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it filtered into everything Garrison was doing, not just the work in our class, but other teachers were hearing of Garrison and they were asking questions about Garrison's work. Uh, his art teacher gave Garrison a, a huge chunk of our school wall to create a, a graffiti art mural that still stands to this day. Wow. And this, this just boosted Garrison's confidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Garrison's a bit of a metaphor for my belief in personalized learning, which is that all students deserve what Garrison got. It shouldn't just be one student who is struggling with school or school, quote unquote, isn't for them. I think if I'm working with 25 learners, they all deserve to have that highly experienced or personalized approach. And we're going to talk more about public uh, sharing as yeah. part of um, inquiry-based learning. Um, now you encourage your students to do a garrison. Yeah. Um, do you have any students that might not be able to flourish in that uh, setting? Yeah, you know, I think that the beautiful thing about this approach, inquiry-based learning, is it really is, uh, it provides me the ability to work one-on-one -on -one with students and, and really meet their needs. And mm -hmm. so if a student is anxious about publicly displaying their learning to an authentic audience or uh, you know, showcasing their understanding in a really huge 
visible way, mm -hmm. um, I could work one-on-one -on -one with them to take strides in the right direction. Authenticity is something that comes up several times yeah. in the book. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean when you say authentic? Yeah, authentic uh, in my mind means, you know, I, I have to start with relevance to the learner. And I think if, if it's relevant to the learner, it's authentic learning. Mm -hmm. And I think the opposite of authentic learning is prescribed learning or standardized learning. I think that really strips the voice from the student out of the learning. Now, I'm guessing we are kind of the same age. I won't yeah. say my age. Yeah, okay. I get younger every year. Um, but some people might say, you know, uh, we went through this uh, school system. Yeah. We're um, relatively successful. Yeah. Why change things? Yeah, well, I think, you know, content and data, you know, get a bad rep. I think, you know, those pieces of learning are really important. But now content is just so readily accessible to learners. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, whether it's access to technology uh, or the role they have in, in the world around them, they're just constantly engaged with content. And so I think if we have a content-driven classroom, um, I think we're not doing our students justice. I think they are uh, naturally creators and producers and interactors with the world around them, whether it's the tangible world or the digital world. And I think if we continue to lead with content when content is so easily available, I think, yeah, we're doing them a disservice. So you're saying that uh, the way we teach should evolve with the time that we're in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think content's important. I think content uh, allows us to talk about a discipline or uh, it allows us to have the jargon to speak intelligently about uh, a, a, an area in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but if content is what we're constantly assessing or constantly putting importance on in the classroom, I think it's not enough. Um, you write that the basis of your teaching philosophy is relationships yeah, first. Yeah. What does it mean day to day in your classroom? Well, it looks like many things at many times. It looks like a high five in the hallway to a student that I don't know in the hopes that in two years later when they enter my class, we have a connection. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, constant check-ins with students, asking them to reflect on their learning, asking them how they're feeling about their learning and asking them to document that. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like flexibility. I think all learners are different and they require a teacher in the room to understand that not only do they have different interests and passions and curiosities, but they have different learning needs. They may need more time mm -hmm. or they need more support or they may not. And that allows me to, having the relationships, allows me to have that flexibility. Uh, your approach is inquiry-based learning. That's correct, um, yeah. <clears throat> before explaining it, um, explain, uh, paint us a picture. What happens at the beginning of a school year? In my classroom? In your classroom. Yeah, in my classroom on the first day, uh, I used to give our kids a syllabus, a course outline, that mm -hmm. I had created because I had this grand vision of mine of what learning should look like. And part of that was prescribed from the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. um, and now in the inquiry classroom, uh, we co-create that document. So there's some must do and must know pieces to each teaching area and teaching grade. But I really want my student voice on that document. So I'll ask them questions like, what do you want to study? What do you want to question? How do you want to demonstrate your learning? And what means do you want to show us what you understand? Can you give us some examples? Oh, gosh. You know, I've had dancers do choreographed dance pieces. I've had sculptures do art pieces. I've had, uh, you know, mechanics work on automotives. Mm -hmm. You know, that the range is broad. Uh, but by having the range be broad, they're able to create a depth in their learning that I haven't witnessed before. And you say that, I guess, the most integral part of that is it has to be a passion? I think passions are part of it. I mm -hmm. think passion-based learning is fantastic, and I do encourage students to explore their passions. Mm -hmm. But I think passions aren't enough. You know, too often in my career, I've heard from students that they're just not passionate about anything, mm -hmm. and I, I can't fault them for that. You know, I think passions require us to stick with something long-term through the peaks and valleys of making it a passion. Mm -hmm. So inquiry in our classroom is also just curiosities. Do you have a question that you want to explore and have support with and try to answer? It's setting a goal and ha having someone support you in meeting that goal, whether it's getting into a post-secondary institution or becoming a volunteer or learning a musical instrument. Or writing a telenovela. Uh, yeah, <laughs> or... absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, do individual students pursue their individual pro projects or do they collaborate on something more collective as a class? Yeah, it hap it, it, both, yeah. both, absolutely. I have a lot of students who, uh, for a variety of means, they want to come together with a greater group. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had uh, musicians come together to co-write lyrics and the reason they wanted to come together is because they're in a band and that passionate uh, that passionate connection between mm -hmm. them allowed it to be collaborative. But by no means do I say all students have to work in a collaborative environment. We have students who are introverts, who uh, work best when they're on their own. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I think that's why inquiry is so powerful is because you can truly differentiate for all your students. And for the, um, you explain, you use this analogy of a pool. Uh, so throughout the year, you move from the deep end to the, I guess, the shallow end? Other way. Other way, yeah. the shallow end yeah. to the deep end. Yeah, that's so right. So explain how that works. Yeah, so in, in I think the, the greatest fault of 
teachers wanting to adopt inquiries, we go to the deep end too fast, too soon. So that's the, the free end. based. Yeah, area. and so the deep end is where students are asking their own questions mm -hmm. and they're finding their own resources and then they're, they're producing something, an artifact of learning. And I was at fault uh, in going to the deep end too soon when I first adopted an inqu inquiry model because it's the most powerful form of learning where mm -hmm. the student has the most control over learning. And it's very exciting for everyone involved, but I felt that students were too anxious to go there too soon. Mm -hmm. So the swimming pool analogy, traveling from the shallow end to the, the medium depth to the deep, allows students to see what inquiry can look like before they take complete control over their learning. Mm -hmm. It allows us to talk about the skills necessary to be successful. Um, the competencies that I think global citizens need to have in our world today. And we can actually have rich conversations about those pieces as the year goes by. Now, thinking uh, back to Garrison, yeah. um, is one of the benefits of this type of learning that students will be able to find a passion within them? That they might not know about? Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely, I think that's a big piece of the puzzle is students are researching something that they, they think they may have a passion in and slowly what surfaces is a true love for something. What's your definition of a passion? Um, my definition of passion is something that you stuck with long term, <laughs> something that you've grappled with mm -hmm. and you've, uh, you, you've come to love it. What if a student is passionate about video games? Um, yeah. Isn't it just an excuse for playing more video games? Well, the truth is, if they're passionate about it, then we need to explore it, yeah. <laughs> and I've seen many students turn video games into an inquiry. I have a student right now who's actually building a video game to reflect a social studies unit that he's mm -hmm. learning. So um, if a student's truly passionate about it, and I see these passions surface throughout the year, and it goes back to relationships, knowing your students, asking these types of questions. What do you care about? The same question I asked Garrison, what do you truly love to do, is a question I ask throughout the whole, the whole year. Mm -hmm. So by the time they're choosing a passion or a curiosity, I have a pretty good idea of what it is before they even say it. And throughout the year, you're also keeping in touch with the students. You have them write in journals? Absolutely, yeah. What do you hope to get from that? Yeah, so they journal. They also blog, all my students blog. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the journal reflections really are allowing me to have a, a lens into what it is that they could do later on in the year. Um, not just an idea of their passions and their interests and their curiosities, but I also could, sorry, to get them to reflect on their learning in a metacognitive perspective. Mm -hmm. What's working for you, what's not working for you, so they're also becoming a deeper learner. And you also write about soft skills. Yeah. What are soft skills? Well, I think soft skills are all those pieces that we're never teaching in high school or in elementary school, but we just expect them to learn, whether mm -hmm. it's communication or collaboration or stick with itness. And I think those are pieces <laughs> that in the inquiry classroom, you could actually tangibly, explicitly talk about, and they're meaningful because they lead to success. Um, you write that inquiry-based learning uh, makes students better learners. Mm. Um, how does this manifest itself? Well, I see it in terms of students taking more control over their learning um, and not just uh, designing lessons and units of study for themselves, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think that framework that they've adopted, they can apply to anything in life. You know, they could take it on in a university or any other goal that they have in life and apply the exact same framework for these other aspects of, of their life. And, and that takes learning beyond the classroom as it mm -hmm. should. It should be things that transcend the classroom and continue on in quote unquote the real world. Einstein once said, um, education is what remains after one has forgotten mm -hmm. what one has learned in school. Yeah. Um, how's your method a response to Einstein's uh, theory? I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I want to make my classroom a space that is more relevant to learners. So it reflects the world that they truly live in. There should be no separation between what they see in the world and how they learn outside of school with how they learn inside of school. Do you think this makes students retain knowledge better? I do, yeah, how? absolutely. Well, I think when you start from a place where they're truly engaged and the relevance is there, I think they go deeper, they stick with things longer, and the things that they produce in, in terms of the artifacts of learning, they're much more meaningful. I see a lot less students at the end of the year you know, opening up their binder and throwing it into the recycling bin. I see students continue on with their quote-unquote projects years later, and these goals that they've set for themselves come to fruition. And we mentioned social media earlier, yeah. uh, but it is a, a big component of your pedagogy. Yeah. Um, how do you use it? Well, in a number of ways. You know, I ask all my students to create a blog for many reasons. I want them to interact with an authentic audience outside of our classroom. I think uh, that lends really well to collaboration and finding awesome resources. And it also enriches the conversation around digital citizenship and what awesome online use looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but also with regards to Twitter, I'm always tweeting and, and, and I'm sharing my students' learning to that network of people that I've nurtured over the years in hopes that my students see how learning their are, how, sorry, how relevant their learning is to an authentic audience. Yeah. And public sharing um, is a big component of it. Absolutely. Um, why? 
Well, I, I want them to see that their learning is meaningful, and and when they're when they're handing in something for a single teacher, um, they can just you know, phone it in. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, and it tends the the, the the excitement ends when they hand it in to that quote unquote that inbox, mm -hmm. you know, and and I mark it, and and the worst part of marking it is they're waiting for that instant feedback and that gratification for all the hard work they put into something. Whereas if you have a showcase of learning, you know, which we do at the end of the year, we invite people that we've worked with throughout the year to come and see our students' body of work. Um, there's this excitement around what they've produced and they know that they're going to be talking about their learning with someone that they look up to, someone that they care about or someone that they admire. And that transcends the classroom, as we said earlier. I'm, I'm thinking, though, um, you must have students who are introverts. Mm -hmm. How do you do they how do they feel about sharing their stuff publicly, yeah. especially if it's supposed to be something that's authentic to them? Absolutely. We we work one on one to make that happen for the learner. So, you know, I've had a student, as we said earlier, she created a novella. I was just blown away. Mm -hmm. 140 page kind of masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And she published it so it looked like a, a fantastic book. It had a little QR code, or sorry, a, a barcode on the back mm -hmm. and a price. And she was really apprehensive sharing it at our showcase event. And so what we did is instead of having you know, 100 people come and visit her, we sent people in groups of three or four to come and visit her. And initially, she invited her closest friends. So she kind of warmed up the engine a bit mm -hmm. to get used to talking about something that was really something quite personal with her. Yeah. And I'm guessing, well, from what the examples that you've shown in the book, it seems yeah. like the students learn a lot from you. What yeah. have you learned from the students? Oh. Everything. Yeah, I'm so thankful for my learners. I think they've taught me not just empathy and compassion and patience, but also that uh, we can make a difference in our educational system with regards to showing relevance first, creating mm -hmm. relationships, and how that can lead to, to deeper learning. Mm -hmm. And I, because you use uh, technology so much, yeah. um, and I would be remiss not to ask, you know, some students might not have access to the yeah. technology. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you approach that? Yeah, you know, tech, it, there's an accessibility issue, absolutely, but tech doesn't drive learning. You know, relationships and relevance drive learning in our mm -hmm. classroom, and, and students will use tech if they need to, and if they don't need to, they, they won't use it. And I think the, the, the problem with the tech-infused classroom is when tech drives the learning, just as I said earlier, when content drives the learning. Mm -hmm. If it's truly relevance and student passions and interests, then that tech can be woven in wherever they see fit. I want to go back to passion again, because yeah. it feels like that's the theme in uh, your book, um, and I guess what, why you do what you do. Mm -hmm. um, this passion for the subject, passion for life. What if the passion is missing? Yeah. Then how does inquiry-based learning um, function? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's where inquiry op is, is open up to other options. It, it just doesn't need to be passion-based learning. You know, I've had students who, through showing them different resources or videos or texts, they see something that is compelling. It's a curiosity. It's a provocation. And they see something that they want to explore there further. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a passion, but surely once they explore it more deeply and more meaningfully, it, it very well could turn into a passion. Um, it sounds like if, like if you have 30 students in your yeah, class, yeah. that means that you have 30 individual syllabuses, I suppose, yeah, right? Yeah. It sounds like a lot of work for uh, the teacher. Yeah. Um, have you had people push back on that? Yeah, you know, I firmly believe the more voice and choice we give our students, the more structures we have to put into place for everyone to be successful in that classroom. Um, so there hasn't been pushback. There's just been a question for clarity of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where I think, you know, my classroom is very powerful towards that free inquiry deep end of the pool is there are structures to help students be successful and to help me be successful in supporting them. Mm -hmm. As you said, 30 different topics, 30 different projects, 30 different research angles, and I'm supporting them all. Mm -hmm. And uh, tech helps. You know, I'm able to help my students organize themselves in ways that allow me to better support them using tech. But I think also just the, the structures that I have in place. One, one great piece is uh, my students all do a plan and pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's literally like Dragon's Den. We sit down for five minutes and they pitch me their learning. Mm -hmm. And they tell me why it's meaningful and why they could be successful. Um, and we explore how we could support each other through that pitch process. Any situation where you tell the student, no, that's not yeah, going to work? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, a big piece is, you know, is it achievable? Is your dream doable in the scope of time that we have? Mm -hmm. um, and so I do ask them to reconsider a few pieces. And is it grade level appropriate, right? I want all my students to be not just operating at where they should be, but if I'm giving them a month or two months of our class time to be chewing on this really relevant information, mm -hmm. it has to be worthy of that in our, in our coursework. Your foreword is uh, written by Alex Kuros. That's correct, um, yeah. Who is he? Alec is a T uh, professor at University of Regina, a uh, mentor of mine. We met online. Uh, he was asking just 
broadly to anyone that was following him at the time, you know, uh, can someone help me with inquiry? And I admired his work for years, and so I kind of piped up, and it turned into a bit of a friendship, and someone I'm so thankful that he was willing to write the foreword. Yeah. And, and in the foreword, he writes, uh, teachers are typically uh, ill-equipped ill to carry out real inquiry with their mm -hmm. students. Um, is it because they, uh, you, you hate releasing control? Releasing I think, control? I think that's a piece of the puzzle for yeah. sure. I think, you know, as, as an educator, uh, I experienced a different learning model in high school and I experienced a different learning model in university and even I was trained to become a teacher at a very different learning model mm -hmm. and to transition into more of a shared ownership over learning, it's been a, a struggle and it's taken me a number of years to get used to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's why the book really resonates with teachers is they could see the how behind the why. I think the why is relevant. I think teachers know we have to do things differently for our learners today, mm -hmm. but I think seeing how it's done has been really meaningful to teachers. And how early can you start in grade-based yeah. learning? Yeah. Oh, kindergarten absolutely you know we talked about my children offset and how uh, you know transformational they were or meaningful they were in my transformation as a teacher and I think students from a young age need to understand that questioning questions are important mm -hmm. and that questions can drive learning and and their questions should be honored in the classroom so in the kindergarten classroom for example we have a, a curiosity jar it's a big mason jar mm -hmm. and at any time in the day uh, a student can ask for the teacher to write a question down to put it in the jar mm -hmm. and then once a week they pull out these questions and they seek to explore them or answer them using a variety of means whether it's phoning a grandparent or getting on YouTube or going to the library and getting a book. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, and again, I guess with school too, uh, parents are, should be involved in schooling. Yeah. How can mm -hmm. parents support students who are um, being taught inquiry-based learning? Yeah, I think the inquiry classroom, the doors are, are open, both mm -hmm. literally and metaphorically. And I think that the more teachers tinker with inquiry and understand that you know, we have a living library around us, whether it's parents or relatives or friends, uh, we need to invite them into these conversations. And, you know, I have students who go home and they interview family members as part of their inquiry. And mm -hmm. the ties that connect us between school and home are just so rich when you do that. And what's your hope moving forward for yeah. inquiry-based learning? Uh, my hope is that more teachers tinker and question and, and show that student questions can be a part of the classroom and uh, try it on for size. You know, start small, mm -hmm. but think big. Think, dream big for our kids. And start small, take small steps towards making that dream a reality. And we're almost done, but I just remembered another question. Yeah. When I was reading it, I was surprised that this, you can actually use inquiry-based learning for math. Yeah, yeah. I, I know a ton of math colleagues who uh, present a, a problem or a concept or a challenge, and they just open up that challenge to whatever technique or equations or methods students know to answer that question. So I'm from Victoria, BC, mm -hmm. you know, we're a coastal town, and a great one that a colleague did in the last year was, you know, he showed them footage of a ship moored in harbor that was about to become beached. And so the problem was, how do you know when to get that boat out of harbor before it comes beached? That was the question. Uh -huh. And the students came at this problem with so many different understandings of how math could help solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It was relevant, it was authentic, and it was student-led from that point on. So it's not just humanities and arts, it's Absolutely for all subjects. Absolutely not. No, you know, yeah. I see it in the art classroom, I see it in the science classroom. I think a great shift the teacher needs to make is, you know, to back away from content and, and the importance of content and, and bringing that student voice to the conversation. Trevor, it's been a pleasure thank you, meeting you and congratulations on the book. And thank you so much for making the trip all the way from BC to thank speak you. to us. Thank you for having me. Take care. Yeah. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.